It was under Pericles' rule in the 5th century BC that Athens lived its golden age. King Pericles was the architect of Athenian splendor. He promoted democracy. The city changed completely through and through. When he rose to power, he created the Acropolis atop the rocky plateau that towered over the center of the city. A group of temples and monuments of which the Parthenon is the most famous. Its marble pediment was painted in bright colors. Parthenon means Athena's home. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom and the city's protector. Both a gigantic statue of her and the city's treasury were housed here. The building is one of the most well-known in the world and measures 70 meters long and 30 meters wide. Some of the sculptures from the Parthenon are currently being preserved at the new Acropolis Museum. This frieze is nearly 2,500 years old. It's the work of the sculptor Phidias, and it decorated the Parthenon in its entirety with the tales of the first great Panathenaea. The Panathenaea was the biggest religious festival held in Athens as it honored the goddess Athena, the city's protector. This fresco, famous the world over, is 160 meters long, with 360 characters sculpted on it. The museum's frieze was completely restored with blocks found here at the Acropolis and preserved in Greece with molds from the British Museum and the Louvre. Gods and goddesses were very important to the Greeks, much more so than men. In order to scale them to human height in the friezes, they often appear seated. The damages suffered by the Parthenon tell the stories of the wars which marked the city, such as the war against the Persians, which demolished part of Athens and the Parthenon about 2,500 years ago. For centuries, Greece was the arena for many legendary battles. The city that symbolizes these confrontations is Sparta, lying 250 kilometers to the south of Athens. Its victory over Athens following the Peloponnese Wars turned Sparta into one of the most powerful cities in ancient Greece. Today, there's almost nothing left of the old city, just the ruins of the Acropolis and its ancient theater, and for good reason. The Spartans didn't hold buildings in the same importance as perhaps the Athenians did. Their buildings were erected on top of brick foundations and there was very little marble around, so they didn't go to great expenses for their building work. Their architecture was coherent with the Spartan mentality in all domains. There aren't really any writers, no writers of tragedies or poets or writers of comedies or actors. There's no historian who wrote the story of Sparta. We only know of it through Athenians, in fact. At that time, the historian Thucydide had a premonition about Sparta. If someday the city were to be destroyed and all that remained were the sanctuaries and their foundations, then posterity would have a hard time believing that its power corresponded to its reputation. The region of Sparta is called Laconia. Anything laconic, or in fact Spartan, is very stripped down, reduced to the essential. When you ask the Spartan, how many do the enemy number? A Spartan would respond, we don't need to know their number, we need to know where the enemy lies. It's these kind of short phrases which define the laconic style. In Sparta, you go straight to the point, you go straight towards the enemy. The best personification of the force, courage and heroism of this town throughout the centuries was King Leonidas. 
He was made famous through his battle until death against the Persians. In ancient Sparta, the ideal citizen was a warrior, and this was not left to chance. The women most likely to give birth to warriors were selected. According to legend, a council of elders decided the fate of the infants. Those that were deemed fit for combat were brought up with a firm hand. Selected at the age of seven, these young warriors were submitted to rigid discipline and intensive training. The young Spartans were practically left to their own devices. They had no clothes, only a blanket. They had to bathe in the Eurotas or in other rivers. They had no beds and slept on rushes or reeds which they collected with their bare hands. All this tied together with daily running and combat training, which was often very violent. There was an island in the centre of the river. When they entered adolescence around the age of 13 or 14, the young Spartans would split up into two teams and access the island via two bridges. They would arrange themselves in military fashion into two phalanxes, two infantries, facing each other. The aim of the game was to push the other team into the water. Game is not really the right word. It was very violent. Everything was allowed. Punches, kicks, using knees, elbows, even biting and gouging eyes out. Sparta has especially made its mark on history due to its political and social model. Leading the city were a small number of citizens called the Equals. They were warriors that lived in the community and that held power. They were served by helots, slaves that were devoid of all civil rights. Sparta's model was like an aristocracy or an oligarchy. Oligarchy meaning the power was held by a limited number of people. Therefore, the aristocrats and oligarchs of other Greek cities admired Sparta. Athens, on the other hand, was always a democracy. Sparta's brutal politics and conservatism caused the rest of Greece to turn against it unanimously. Devoid of alliances, the city collapsed into itself it took a single defeat in Thebes in 371 BC to destroy it. It was Athens, the democracy, that ended up dominating the region. Night falls on Athens. Both by day and by night, the Acropolis is Athenians' favorite backdrop. Few places can boast a view as impressive as the oldest open-air cinema in history. It was built in 1935. The Greeks love the open-air cinema because we have practically six months of summer here. Our programming is very successful. We mainly screen classic American and European films. There are films which work well, especially Hitchcock. Nine dollars and forty cents, this is an outrage. If I were you, I wouldn't pay it. When people call me before the screening to know which film is on, I answer that even if they don't enjoy the film, they can always daydream while looking at the Acropolis. It's 4.30 a.m. Athens still sleeps. But in the central market, things are starting to move. Here in the halls of Ammonia, shopkeepers and the late night owls cross paths. They've come to wash away the excesses of the night before by swallowing an unusual magic potion. The restaurant Iparos has made it their speciality. Rania Karatzeni has been running the business for 10 years. Is everything okay? Careful, the chili flakes are hot. So 
This is the pasta soup which is ready to be served. Pasta means stomach. It's beef stomach. It looks like a blanket the way that it swells up. You need to cut it up afterwards. That's the pasta. The pasta has just been boiled for six to seven hours and now needs to be chopped up. The older generation eats it in bigger pieces, the younger generation, as they're not as used to the flavour and especially when they see it for the first time, they prefer smaller pieces. That way it's easier for them to get it down. I haven't chopped yours up too much. You've got some bits in there but your friend has it well chopped, menu style, so he can handle it. At this time of day, you can see a lot of youngsters that have been out partying and have drunk a lot because beef tripe and beet soup is very good for the stomach. It makes a layer around the stomach and then they can go to sleep. And when they wake up, they won't have a headache or a bad stomach. It's like medicine, except it's not prescribed by a pharmacist. Soon, the atmosphere in the halls welcomes the rest of the city dwellers. Only Athens' monuments seem to escape the effervescence of the Greek capital. Greece is home to some of the most important heritage in the world. The archaeological sites are counted in their thousands. Music was one of the major arts in ancient Greece. It guided the social and religious life of the city. The gods themselves were musicians. When Apollo played his lyre, the other gods of the Olympus would hold their breath. But the myth surrounding the creation of music is undoubtedly that of Orpheus. Whenever the musician sang, no one could resist him, starting with his wife, Eurydice. When she died, Orpheus convinced the god of hell to bring her back to life, thanks to the simple power of music. Nowadays, sacred chanting is what moves the Greeks' hearts. Byzantine music. Invented in the 4th century at the time of the Christianization of the Byzantine Empire, it is inseparable from the dominant religious practice in Greece, Orthodox Christianity. The Catholics have their Gregorian chants. The Orthodox have their Byzantine chant. Konstantinos Politis teaches this traditional music. The art of chanting psalms, Byzantine art, is an art which is still alive today. This is proved by the contemporary pieces that exist. It's not a dead art. In fact, I consider that these musicians create history with their music. Since ancient times, the Greeks have sung about what they do. The chanters of Byzantine music are known as saltus. In this school, the learning consists of a voyage to the center of Orthodox liturgy. Let's take it from the top softly and together. We must keep in mind that it's a funeral hymn. You know, in Orthodox tradition, there is the harmolipi. That means that even in the most dire things, there is always the joy of resurrection that transforms and perfects all things. Let's go from the top. 
This music is very complex. Contrary to the notation system used in Western Europe, the musical characters indicate intervals in melody and not the notes. The Salters also need to learn to read and sing in ancient Greek. A continuous learning process which Dionysius Anastopoulos has followed for 17 years. I study four hours a day because Byzantine music is composed of music theory history, practical exercises and deciphering melodies. Understanding the text is also essential for a good interpretation. The role of Byzantine music is to transmit the word of God. The melody is there to validate biblical scripture. The sun rises over the Acropolis. It's Sunday morning. Athens awakens to the sound of the presidential guard. An immutable ritual is taking place. These soldiers are the Evzones. Dressed in their traditional uniform, they have become one of Greece's emblems. The origin of the Evzones goes back to ancient times. The word Evzone first appears in Homer's epics. The word defines soldiers that have been well trained and had a remarkable capacity for adaptation. Almost 2,000 years later, the Evzones served their country in Greece's war for independence against the Ottoman Empire they became the essential figures of the national uprising. In the 20th century, they distinguished themselves for their courage in the Balkan conflicts and during both world wars. Today, the Evzones are the elite force that guards the parliament and the presidential palace. One of their missions is to mount guard 24-7 around the tomb of the unknown soldier. Their particular march is very measured. a carefully choreographed ballet, which disguises the difficulty involved. In fact, the Evzone's uniform weighs 20 kilograms altogether. Dimitrios and Mialis have been Evzones for six months as part of the military service, which is still mandatory in Greece. But not just anyone can become an Evzone. In order to be an Evzon, you must be over 1.87 meters tall and you need to undergo special training as well as be ready to deal with difficult conditions, especially in terms of the weather, mainly the sun. On top of those conditions, there is mandatory immobility and silence. If someone bothers us, then we tap our weapon on the ground and our superior officer will come and ascertain the problem. But we can only communicate with him through our eyes. One blink means yes, two means no, and three means I don't know. If it's really very necessary, we can whisper. The uniform is part of the ceremony. The ancestral gestures are always performed two by two. Making just one uniform entails more than 80 days work between dressmakers and cobblers. Everything is carried out in the barracks workshop. These techniques are unique to Greece. 
Each color of the uniform has its own meaning. The red symbolizes the blood spilt by the Evzones in their battles throughout the ages. White evokes the purity of intentions of the soldiers and the Greek people's fight. This uniform has survived throughout history and became the soldiers' national uniform after the Greek uprising in 1821 against the Ottoman Empire. It was during that time that it took on the appearance still maintained today. The Fustanella adopted the 400 pleats that symbolize 400 years of freedom from Ottoman domination. Another particular trait of this uniform is the shoes. They're called sarushi. These infamous shoes with their black pom-poms weigh one and a half kilos each. The Evzones even have to consider the terrain when walking. 60 nails are driven into the soles so that they don't slip. And during the battles, they have an extra secret weapon. Popular literature tells us that there would have been a sharp object hidden inside the pom-pom. This could be used in man-to-man -man combat to neutralize their adversary easily. The pom-poms are made out of wool to keep the feet warm in winter. Every Sunday, at the end of the day, the Evzones perform a ceremony. The climb to the summit of the sacred rock of the Acropolis to lower the national flag. Being an Evzone for me means being proud of my country and having good morals. I am aware that I am a symbol of my country. The Evzone and the Acropolis represent Greece. Once the Evzones have completed their weekly ritual, there are a privileged few living in the houses nearby. The people of Anafiotica, a district nestled in the flank of the rock at the foot of the Acropolis. I'm very lucky to be able to hear the flag halyard. Not many people in Greece are lucky enough to be right next to the Acropolis and hear the flag being taken up and down. I like hearing the sound while I drink my wine and watch the flag being taken down. What could be more beautiful? I feel very proud. Even if they're Athenian, they're also very proud of their roots. Our ancestors chose these rocks because it reminded them of their home, Anafi. It was an homage to their roots, to their love of their birthright. Athens is proud of its past. It's a land which has seen its European culture flourish. A unique world in which gods live amongst men. <laughs>